enjoy the grace-filled life that God has planned for you. A, B, C, contented. The next thing with A, B, C is content. Grace-filled living is contented living. The dictionary says that a contented person is one who's satisfied with what they are and what they have. They want nothing more or nothing else. Sometimes I, I tell my wife I got a disease. It's called wantitis. <laughs> you want everything. I want this. I want that. You know, you see a new house being built. You see all these different, you, you know. We all suffer from it. It's the world. I mean, I pursue those. Yeah, I mean, you get the catalogs in the mail. You look at them. Oh, this is nice. So when I go in the post office now, I just throw them right in the bin. I don't want to even look at them. Why? You know, you just got to want to buy something. My wife says to me, don't buy anything. Let's just do three months without buying anything. So I think, just think it's some things we just really have to look out for. That's right. I pursue those catalogs sometimes that flood my mailbox, and I can convince myself that I can't live without something I saw in that catalog. So don't look at it. As we lose our contentment by wishing we were a different person with a different life in a different place, having different gifts and abilities. You ever go there? Yes. Jerry and I now look at each other and say, well, is it a want or is a it a need? need? Yeah. And nine times out of ten, it's a need. Yeah. It's not a want. Yeah. Because what happens is you buy it, you look at it for a while, you get excited, it's it gone. Disappears. It disappears. <laughs> then you need another fix, you know? You got to go out and buy something again. It makes us feel good sometimes, you know? It, the way it just works in our minds and our brains. That's right. That's right. Living a discontented life will suck the grace right out of you. It will cause you to be restless, self-focused, resentful, and envy envious. Hebrews 13.5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, near, never will I forsake you. Now, money isn't evil. I mean, it's, it's a tool. It's the love of money that gets you. You know? What was that? 13.5. 13.5. So, you know, we all, we need it, but God will supply those needs. This is something we must become intentional upon doing, being content. We have to work at it, if you please. We have to pray it into our lives. It doesn't just happen. <coughs> The enemy of your soul, the devil, will trip you up with discontent if you give him the opportunity. He knows a discontented Christian is not going to dispense grace. So he whispers those lies to you, convincing you that your life cannot be complete or full or good unless you have something or someone that you don't have now. But we can learn contentment. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content and in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Philippians 4.12. Let's just kind of go there. Because that whole... I'm going to start at 10. Philippians 4.10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now that at last you... Your care of me hath flourished again, where the view also careful, but ye lack opportunity. Now that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, in whatever state I am, that worth to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed, both to the full and to be hungry, both to the abound and suffer need. Contented living is freedom. And it's grace-filled living. In his book, Knowing God, J.A. Packard says that many church people pay lip service to the idea of grace. But there they stop. Their concept of grace is not so much debased as non-existent. I've been talking here about what it means to live a grace-filled life, to truly understand God's grace to us, which equips us to dispense grace to others. And I find I must be intentional about living a graceful life. 
I have to think about it, pray about it, make choices each day that lead me to be a grace-filled person. You have to be involved with the lives of others. You just can't sit back and be an observer. You have to let God use you. So we've looked at the ABCs of graceful living. A, abound in generosity and good works. B, live a bitterless, bitterless life. We must pull up all the weeds of bitterness as soon as they start to grow. It's like a garden. And C, learn to be content. This is a good description of grace-filled living, though not exhaustive. But where do we get this grace? We can't find it ourselves. We can't obtain it through good works or trying hard. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to those who help us in our time of need. We find grace at the throne of God, which is a throne of grace. God is enthroned in grace. And all the incredible good news is that we approach the throne of grace with confidence. We can be absolutely confident that we will accept there if we go in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we can be absolutely confident that grace will be given to us to help us in any situation or need that we have. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit, I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he searches our minds and our hearts to see what we need. You know, our, our minds are like a database and he can kind of go through it and he, he knows what we need. And through the Holy Spirit, he helps us to move in that direction. But we've got to be willing vessels. You know, we just can't do it. I mean, at work, you have a kid, you know, I know the work you do. How do you deal with it? Only with grace sometimes. I work with people that sometimes are very, very difficult. You know, they don't want treatment. They don't want to be involved. And I have to use grace to engage them and, and get them involved in the treatment that they need because they're so ill they don't know that they need it mentally. It's a hard concept sometimes for people to understand. Does that answer your question? Because we've asked for it, and the Holy Spirit is going to know when to prompt us, us with that right? When, when it's needed at, at any given time. Yeah, yeah. And for me, a lot of times it's biting my tongue, you know. A gentle answer turns away wrath. You know, and, and really, I mean, being in the Word of God also helps us to dispense grace. Mm -hmm. Because you're getting that message you need that morning before you go out, and you'll use it that day. If something in the scriptures pop up when you're doing your daily devotionals in the morning, you're going to realize that, wow, that's something I better pay attention to because I might need that somewhere. You know, I, I told an example of how I was talking to another supervisor at work and he was standing in the room and someone was standing in the hall. They couldn't see him, but they can see me. And we we're having some problems getting some of his people to do what they're supposed to do. And I said, well, Vince, I said, uh, how do you think we can work on this and resolve this problem? Because he's starting to get mad at me. And I said that to him. Well, gee, Vince, how do you think we can work this out? You know? He said, oh, we're, we're going to work together. I said, okay, that sounds good. And, and, the, and the girl standing in the hall, she looked like, how did you do that? How did you do that? I said, a gentle answer turns away wrath. I was being graceful to him. Him and I got to be really good friends. Yeah, well... A little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It helps. It helps. Yeah. You're not the big bully guy. Right, but you're showing, you're showing love because yeah. you're not addressing that bad temper. Right. You know, you're not addressing that. You're letting it slide. It's just like the kids I work with giving them a choice. They feel that they have a power when you give them yeah. a choice. You're still in control, but they don't know that. Well, you know, when I used to have to get an injection, I'd give them a choice. You could take it by injection or you could take it by mouth. That's the choice I give them. You're going to get it no matter what, you know. <laughs> Pick your choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to say something, Heather? Um, where I work, there's this one particular person that's very, very difficult to deal with. And I was praying about how to be able to deal with this person. How can I 